As Farron said, my name is Fisher Derdarian. I am the executive director of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation, which was just recently founded, oh gosh, back in July this year. So it's just a few months old. Uh, and I, I was actually a former student of Sir Rogers at the University of Buckingham, was a part of his MA program, and uh, had the pleasure of actually studying alongside one of our, our speakers for this uh, session today. Uh, but was just, you know, like everyone here, I think, uh, was, was taken by um, the immense knowledge and, and really the wide expanse uh, that, that Roger wrote on, that he thought on, that he, he was able to discuss and that he produced. And I'd been a fan of his for years and, and so was pleased to have the opportunity to study under him. Uh, as I'm sure anyone who's spent any personal time with Roger, it's just always an amazing, uh, or rather it was always an amazing experience just to uh, listen to him and soak, him up, soak up all that he had to say. Uh, and over the course of my time as his student, we got to talking about what an organization might look like that was devoted to furthering his work, furthering his legacy. Uh, and this really birthed the idea of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. And, and it was in the works, you know, up until he, he was diagnosed with cancer and, and passed away all too soon. Um, and, and so on the occasion of his passing, you know, I had all the more reason um, to move forward with this project and, and to establish it. And to that extent, uh, the mission uh, of the foundation is to establish Scruton's legacy through the conservation, care, and continuation uh, of traditional culture and wisdom. And, and we've held a number of conversations to that extent and, and hope to hold a mini number more. Uh, but we're not here for that today, so I'll, I'll stop there and, and move on to uh, the actual conversation that we'll be having, which is uh, with two different speakers. Uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce them in the order that they'll pre be presenting. Uh, the first speaker is Zoltan Peto. And, and you'll have to forgive me, Zoltan, as I say these things, you know, with my uh, American Californian tongue. I will probably butcher a number of the names, but you can correct me <laughs> when you start speaking. Uh, Zoltan recently defended his PhD thesis at the Pasmani Peter Catholic University and currently works as an assistant research fellow at the University of Public Services uh, Tomas Molnar Research Institute in Budapest, Hungary. His interests are conservative political philosophy from the end of the 18th to the 21st century. He wrote a study about Edmund Burke and is currently working on publishing his dissertation about Eric Maria Ritter von Kuhnheld Lenin. Uh, our second speaker, very good, okay, I'm, I'm glad yeah. I, I passed with that. <laughs> our second speaker is Sebastian, who, who I mentioned, I actually had the, the pleasure of studying alongside and, and uh, greatly benefited from his presence in the classroom, or, or I should say around the, the table eating and, and drinking wine. Uh, Sebastian is a PhD student at the University of Buckingham. He was supervised uh, for MA research by Roger Scruton. He supervised his PhD research in political philosophy uh, and Christian ethics until Scruton's death in January 2020. Uh, Sebastian has continued his doctoral research under the same on the same subject, excuse me, under the supervision of Dr. Andrew Pinson and Dr. Alicia Gaskinska. He is a regular wine columnist, and his book on the connection between metaphysics and aesthetics, The World is God's Icon, is to be published by Angelical Press this month. So with that, I'll step aside and, and let you take the floor, Zoltan. Okay, thank you very much for the in introduction. I would like to greet everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here. My hey. title of my... Here, there's my question. Yeah, okay. Okay, can you hear me well? Everyone? Yes, we can hear you well, Zoltan. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so my, my the, the title of my pe uh, paper sounds as Authority, Allegiance, Tradition, The Meaning of Conservatism by Roger Scruton. When, as a university student of history and aesthetics, I started to study Burke's reflections on the French Revolution, which was the topic of my thesis, so Roger Scruton's name who was probably the most important voice of modern British conservatism in the 20th century, immediately uh, came into the picture. Burke is considered to be the beginning of conservatism, and Scruton's self-identification as a conservative also began with an event in France during the 1968 students' uprising. As he says later, I quote him, I suddenly realized I was on the other side. That's when I became a conservative. I knew I wanted to conserve things rather than pull them down. When I read these words, these words, I felt an immediate sympathy with Scruton and also a need to 
delve deeper into the meaning of conservatism. There is no doubt that conservatism has a broader meaning than simple preservation. The most significant of the so-called and self-identified conservative thinkers of the 20th century, as uh, Russell Kirk or Michael Oakeshott, reluctantly identified themselves with the idea of conservatism. For them, the word ism implied an ipso facto meaning of abstract doctrine, which they intended to avoid. However, we can interpret the possible differences of the meaning of the word conservatism more broadly. For example, if conservatism is not primarily defined as a worldview, but as an attitude arising from a worldview, interpreted in this way, it no longer refers primarily to values and certain dogmatics of the political ideas, but to an attitude that is related to the inevitable change. While political ideologies such as liberalism and so socialism see the history of mankind as a slow process of moral, intellectual and social self-perfection, as a kind of Darwinian evolution applied to the social political sphere, the survival of the fittest, ergo, the best structures, conservatism does not see inevitable change necessarily as progress. Burke saw the French Revolution, the beginning of the modern politics, not as progress, but as disaster. However, conservatism discovers not only degradation in the historical processes. We can also talk about a conservatism that thinks in terms of evolution. This evolution, however, is not related to the biological meaning of the term, as most conservatives tend to see man not as purely biological being, but a being which is both biological and spiritual. The conservative evaluation of the meaning of evolution is no way contains the idea of development open to infinity, as it would be an idea which is not supported by any empirical experience and also excludes transcendence. Conservative evolutionism can be linked to the development of civilizations and can be described as a slow accumulation of common experience. This position was emphasized primarily by classics as Burke and Hume as a response to the radicals' interpretation of the idea of human development as infinite progress. This development, conservatives say, is actually due to the interplay of favorable conditions, such as when the germ of a plant falls just where all the conditions can be found to grow into a huge tree. There is no ine inevitability in it, and the major threat to this is even the revolutionary impatience, which is perplexed by things being not purely rational or cannot be derived and deduced from strictly utilitarian principles. In his writings against the revolution, Burke spoke of the continuity of things, although the facts that make up our world do change, their essence remains the same. Roger Scruton's third book, Meaning of Conservatism, first published in 1980, and since then, as a particularly influential work of modern conservative thinking, has been published several times and translated into many languages, Hungarian also. The work intended to outline the concepts, I quote him, with which conservatives might provide themselves with a creed. Quote him. In order to avoid misunderstandings, the author states at the very beginning of the work that the teaching of conservatism must be distinguished from both the underlying philosophy and the specific politics derived from it. Although there is no universal conservative policy, there is a misconception that there is no conservative thinking. It is a misunderstanding to believe there are no strong convictions and principles that encourage conservatives to act, nor a general view of society. At the same time, conservatives themselves 
must recognize that without theoretically exposed principles, their worldview can lose its intellectual appeal. And even if many of them do not want to believe it, I quote Scruton, by intellectuals that modern politics is made. For Scruton, a suitable starting point for articulating the principles is derived from the fact that conservatives' political approach of civil society differs from that of both liberals and socialists. Liberalism, which tends to see the state as, a, as an instrument of individual freedom, seeks to separate society from the state as much as possible, for that the state can restrict the individuum as little as possible. The conservative, according to Scruton, on the other hand, sees the state as an end in itself. Therefore, according to the conservative, the state is not a machine, but an organism, in fact, a person. The idea of the state requires the idea of a corporate person. The conservative state must protect the conservative society in which it is not the departments, but the corporate persons from companies to churches to clubs and schools plays the main role. By strengthen, strengthening autonomous institutions, the state strengthens itself. That's why the conservative conception of society is inseparable from the conception of the state. This approach, according to Scruton, has three, three key concepts, authority, allegiance, and tradition. What does authority mean? Above all, it is a recognized legitimate power, which we can best imagine on the basis of the analogy of the family, that is the social unit, which like civil society is not based on contract or choice, but on natural need. From the beginning, the child conforms to the power of the parents. It is the in inalienable duty of parents to direct their children. In this relation uh, is the power, namely the power based on authority, uh, which is uh, which the parent already possesses when the child is born. Authority, however, is not identical with power. It signifies the acceptance of the right to exercise power. Its recognition thus presupposes the legitimacy of power. Power without authority is pathetic. It breeds violence without arousing respect. Power and authority seek each other. Their pursuit is the core of politics and the state created by their encounter is the existing institutional order. The conservative assumes that the state needs power for authority. Another issue is that he does not want to see this power naked in the sphere of politics but clothed in the constitution, operated through the legal system. According to Scruton, our obligations to the state, like those to the family, do not arise from a free commitment. The possibility of a treaty in itself presupposes an existing social order, not only because without it would hardly be possible to keep a treaty, although this is also true, but and even more so, because the concept of a tr the treaty presupposes common institutions and the common concept of freedom. They cannot come from a contact, contract that is made possible even by them. It can be said that society exists through authority and the recognition of this authority also means allegiance to a bond that is not based on a treaty, but is actually transcendental. Allegiance is undoubtedly a condition of social existence. It makes society more than a set of individuals, as liberals tend to think. As Scruton argues, the condition of mankind requires that individuals, while they exist and act as autonomous beings, do so only because they can first identify themselves as something greater, as members of a society, group, class, state or nation. Allegiance makes necessary the holding of traditions. And this thought leads to the third concept needed to describe a conservative conception of society. 
The essence of tradition can be grasped in the fact that it can be traced back to an intention not directed toward, towards the future, but towards the past. According to Scruton, tradition is not simply a custom or a right, but a very important uh, form of social knowledge. Burke thought of the, this kind of knowledge, criticizing the a priori thinking of the French revolutionaries. Through tradition, the individual acquires the ability to tacitly understand social habits, thereby knowing what he or she does when he or she enters the network of social contact. Tradition can also be a factor which can be the antagonist of freedom, or at least the abstract and ideological view on freedom. In Scruton's uh, views, however, freedom cannot be in the heart of conservative thought. I quote him, hence the aim at freedom is at the same time to aim at the constraint which is its precondition. According to him, freedom is not a precondition, but a consequence of accepted social relations. If we want to value freedom, we must also, also value what makes it possible. That is the social order as a cornerstone of personality and identity. The main difference between conservatism and liberalism lies in the fact that for the former, individual freedom is not of absolute value, but is subordinated to other higher values, primarily the authority of legitimate government. Scruton's conviction evokes Burke. In politics, it is not primarily freedom that satisfies people, but good government. And without institutions, freedom is worth of nothing. The freedom enjoyed and respected by the English was not born as a realization of some kind of abstract idea of freedom, but the legacy of historically established institutions without which it would not have been viable. From emphasizing the limits of freedom, stems a kind of suspicion of democracy. Today, politicians and the most of the political thinkers do not dare to openly question the principles of democracy. At most, they criticize some of its concrete forms and solutions. However, according to Scruton, conservatives need, need to be aware that governmental legitimacy cannot be gained purely by democratic elections. Burke therefore did not, Burke de therefore did not think in the reflections that uh, universal suffrage has anything to do with governmental legitimacy, reminds Scruton his readers. Democratic elections are neither a necessary nor a sufficient principle of representation because the principle of representation belongs to, to institutions that can only fulfill their purpose with a background of solid authority. The relentless democratization of institutions with authority can lead to a situation when power falling into the hands of those who can circumvent the responsibility of exercising it. Even democracy must be based on a continuum that does not stem from the principle of democracy itself, but from the continuity of institutions and authorities. Democracy needs a constitution, and that must be outside the control of democratic change. However, there is another reason why conservatives are often skeptical of democratic process procedures. And this can be traced back to the realization that even if a democracy is happened to work fairly, it will always serve the needs of those in the present. It does not take into account the aspects of those who are no longer with us or are no, not yet with us. Burke has already articulated the impact importance of taking into account the deceased, deceased and the unborn. But according to Scruton, it is worth to emphasizing this again. From the beginning of time, respect for the dead was the foundation of institution building. The respect shown for them forbids us to treat their heritage arbitrarily. By respecting the dead, we also protect the interests of our descendants. 
Democracy must therefore be limited so that the voices of the dead and the unborn are to be heard in the political processes. Conservatives therefore see the traditional or and also a constitutional monarchy as a very fortunate form of political order. Since the ruler is not elected by the votes of the citizens, he cannot be seen merely as a representing the interests of the present generations. They quote uh, Scruton, and to argue that the hereditary principle confers office and the responsibility at random and without consideration to the fitness of the person who receives them is to repeat an objection to every mode of preferment. It is to be supposed that the ability to fascinate an electorate, as Hitler did, has some connection with the fitness for public office. Thank you for your attention. And uh, now we can uh, hear from uh, Sebastian if you're, you're ready to take the floor. Okay, thanks, Fisher. Um, and that that was uh, very nice to listen to. Thanks, Sultan. Um, well, it's a great honour uh, to uh, to speak here, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. Uh, I'll touch on some of the same themes, um, particularly the focus on the the importance of the corporate person. Um, as a major theme to conservative thinking uh, and um, the role this plays in understanding um, the democratic process. Uh, but the, but I'm, I'm coming to this from the angle of the question of patriotism and uh, national identity. Um, I, I was asked uh, or at least told to feel free to drop in something personal. Um, and certainly, in engaging with this topic, I'm engaging with a way in which um, Roger was able to straighten out some things for me. Uh, th there's There's been a tension in my own life between ethnic identity and national identity, um, coming from Mediterranean stock on my uh, paternal side and and uh, Polish stock on my maternal side um, and uh, now having married a Romanian and living in a bilingual household um, uh, the all of this uh, um, you know if I, if I were a if I were a dog I definitely would not be a pedigree let's put it that way so so um hmm. Uh, and yet, regarding um, regarding my attitude toward England as a nation, uh, my interior experience, uh, I feel intensely English. And so, working out, uh, navigating my way through this is uh, certainly um, the, whatever tension there is there was resolved by thinking about Roger's ways of engaging with this. So. Um, first, I think it's one has to acknowledge that there has been a tendency on the political right to root uh, cultural and political arguments in ethnic identity. And um, this is not a tendency found, interestingly enough, uh, among the early conservatives. And um, you don't find arguments of that kind in Burke or Maestra or uh, Chateaubriand or any of these people. And it, I mean, this is a historical point, but I do wonder whether this is a transposing of it, an enlightenment principle of nationhood and uh, certain sympathies that the enlightened despots and so forth had in the 18th century into later conservative or right-wing discourse. Um, in any case, um, I think that the question of ethnic identity or racial history and identity, uh, I think that these principles provide a completely insufficient foundation for conservative ideas. Um, and I'll try to explore a little bit of that in a minute. Um, Certainly, I think 
from reading Roger, um, he certainly had such arguments or arguments of that kind. They at least had a certain arbitrariness to them. Uh, the, why, why skin pigment and not something else? Um, and also, they didn't seem to really lead anywhere. And interestingly enough, I mean, it is worth commenting that I think largely under the influence of Roger, arguments, ethnic-based or racial-based arguments, race-based arguments, um, have been really totally removed from uh, mainstream conservative discourse. And that territory is now largely occupied by the political uh, left, who are increasingly adopting uh, ethnicity-based arguments or arguments based on racial history. And um, I think it can be plausibly argued that the fruits of uh, that have not been terribly good. Um, the complexities of which uh, I can't discuss here because of time constraints. Another point is that um, just from a pr pragmatic, a pragmatic perspective, um, in an age of increasing movement of peoples and, and, uh, and immigration and people going to different countries for work and so forth, um, these arguments are just uh, frankly inappropriate. And uh, rooting conservative arguments in, in principles of ethnic identity and racial history, they're counter it's counterproductive in that it alienates conservatism from mainstream political discourse. So that, I mean, that's more of a pragmatic point. In any case, um, considerations of ethnicity don't seem to deliver what accounts for patriotic feeling, but seem to be presented as symbolic for something that is threatened. So when the when when the you know uh, British National Party uh, uh, enthusiast or or some kind of ultra right wing um, uh, figure is asked why why do why do you love England, actually even though he might have sympathy for all sorts of race uh, race based arguments those aren't the those aren't the arguments he advances in order to account for his own affection toward england he doesn't say um you know well i love england because of the pasty complexion of the majority of people who live here you know what what he says is um our, you know, our way of life and our national church and our parliament. And I think this is being threatened by, uh, for example, a, a Muslim takeover of this town or this place. So this is what he, they're not actually uh, racial concerns. So um, what I think the, the task is, is to recognize that these arguments are not a Appropriate, they don't lead anywhere. The, the, uh, the line from Tennyson's poem Hands All Round um, he says, the, That man's the best conservative who lops the moulded branch away. I think these are, are moulded branches that you have to have to lop away, but you have to um, nonetheless ask why they grew in the first place. And um, and so if they are symbolic, actually, these anxieties around racial and ethnic identity, what are they symbolic of? And my own view here is that Roger's huge achievement was to reroute the question of patriotism and national identity in the appropriate moral disposition. And so I'll go into that in a little bit. But I'll start off by quoting from his early work, um, The Meaning of Conservatism. He says, quote, every society contains the seeds of a constitution in the form of custom, tradition, precedent and law. So this and this is a, a, a theme that continues through all of Roger's thought, I think, that uh, constitution is not to be understood in the in the revolutionary sense of a written manifesto but is to be understood 
uh, as a settled way of life in a territory settled by law. This is what it, the term denotes in his thought. I continue. Um, but it but it may have to fight to preserve these, and from every successful fight, a degree of nationhood emerges. For most of us, the state means not just government, but also territory, language, administration, established institutions, all growing from the interaction of unconscious custom and reflective choice. He continues, the nation state is the state at the extreme of self-consciousness. It has its territory, its people, its language, sometimes even its church, end quote. So there are these themes that arise from very early on in his thinking about um, conservative attitude prejudicial feeling, an affection for a settled territory, making a part of that territory one's own, the whole notion of homecoming and the, and the, the role of property in his thought, a respect for the long-standing institutions of the constitution of that way of life, and a desire to understand them and to, to conserve them. Um, and a, a desire to understand and in turn lay claim to a cultural inheritance, uh, which you you which you're there's you have an obligation to make your own. Uh, if you um, uh, if you live in England, um, it's not uh, enough simply to say, well, I suppose this is my uh, culture because, you know, um, I, I, I watch neighbours, uh, I watch EastEnders in the afternoon or whatever. Well, what, what you have to uh, do is really try to understand the, um, the, the cultural foundations of this land so that you can lay claim to them. And that's a moral disposition uh, that, that, uh, that is placed um, uh, in the interiority of the subject. So um, these are the themes, this is the phenomena. The question is what actually accounts for this? And what emerges first in, in Roger's thought is what in uh, How to Be a Conservative he refers to as the first person plural of settlement, the, the we of the nation. But, um, and Ferenc has already uh, mentioned this facet already, but I think we have yet to discover just how important this is in the later thought of Roger. The second person perspective in, in Roger's thought and the, the role this plays in his conservative approach not only to uh, politics, but to more broadly social criticism. Seeing you as another I. And, and this um, he develops enormously in the uses of pessimism, in green philosophy, and particularly more than anywhere else in the soul of the world. Um, seeing one's fellow countrymen as another subject, engaged in the same project, trying to understand your perspective and trying to have his perspective understood by you, to be afforded the same respect due to a reasonable person with very similar concerns. And, and for Roger, this was absolutely essential if you were going to have a functioning democracy, uh, that when somebody voted differently to you, you had to assume that they had all the same uh, concerns and desire for the nation's good and, uh, and uh, a desire to see you and your family flourish and so on. And that's why they voted uh, the way they did. Uh, which is why um, if, a, if the, your, your preferred party suddenly uh, found itself in, or sorry, if not, uh, if the undesirable party found itself in power, um, there, he said that it was necessary to have a, an immediate desire to unite the country under that party because of this um, 
this ability to see all of those who voted that way as an, as other eyes, other subjects, other uh, others seeking the same good as you. Um, and in order to develop this second personal perspective, it was necessary to educate the soul. It was necessary to educate the soul. And this is why civil society before the state plays such a massive part in his thought, that it's necessary to have friendships and club and clubs and hobbies and, uh, and churches where you participate in a liturgy together, because you're doing things not as uh, simply a, a unified will of the us. And it's not, it's not no longer just the, the first person plural, we are doing this, but it's somewhere in between that and a, a number of isolated individuals. It's the union of subjects. It's the union of, of eyes, so to speak. Um, and this is why, uh, just to pick up on a point that was discussed earlier about, you know, can art make us good? Well, maybe if, if we say art, maybe not, but perhaps if we broaden it out to can serious leisure make us good, of which art is a category, can serious recreation, can, the, can, can that to which, uh, that at which the, the humane disciplines point, can that make us good? Well, you might say, uh, another way to frame this question is, um, can being together and seeing the world from each other's perspectives, can that make you good? Well, I think there's a jolly robust case for saying yes. Um, uh, this is this 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 could bring us back to Aristotle's point that the 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 loner is either a god or a monster. And and so um, and this was I just want to pick up one last little point. Um, this is completely consistent, I think, uh, with. A point that Roger made very briefly in 2018 in his discussion with Jordan Peterson at Cambridge, um, which is he made this point that cultural appropriation, one of the great sins uh, today, cultural appropriation is a fundamental prerequisite for patriotic feeling and national identity. That it's, it is essential that the immigrant who arrives in England is willing to appropriate the culture of England, is willing to, to make, to lay claim to that and make it his own. If he's going to settle and make a family and so forth, it's absolutely essential that, uh, that his children be raised in such a way as to as to believe that they are not uh, isolated aliens in a foreign land, but that this is a place they can call home. Uh, it's um, it's also, and this is where you might want to uh, perhaps if he had lived longer, he would have done this. You could develop the second personal perspective to the corporate persons of nations. It's absolutely essential that each nation deems itself eligible to appropriate the cultures of other nations. The, the English really do believe that the curry is their national dish. Uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, um, this is right and this is good. And so when, you know, Roger in an interview was once asked, could, please, could you sum up conservatism in one sentence and he said well I can do better than that I can sum it up in a word C conservatism is love it says in as much as it is uh, a philosophy conservatism is it is the disposition to affirm things to choose things to hold on to things to love things rather than to to always ask the question what can we tear down what, what can we deconstruct it's, it's first and foremost what 
grateful for? What can we hold on to? What can we treasure? Um, and so uh, I'll finish that with uh, the whole stanza of Hands All Round by Alfred Lord Tennyson, because I think this pretty much sums up everything I have to say about this facet of Roger's thought. First, drink a health this solemn night, a health to England, every guest. That man's the best cosmopolite who loves his native country best. May freedom's oak forever live with stronger life from day to day. That man's the best conservative who lops the moulded branch away. Thank you. Wonderful. Nice to uh, clap for you. Uh, and I invite everyone watching to go ahead and submit questions if they have any. Uh, I don't see any coming in yet, so I'll go ahead and start with just a few questions for, for the both of you. Uh, Sebastian, you know, I'm in agreement, of course, with your, your point and, and being a fellow, you know, dedicated Scrutonian. Um, appreciate appreciate the arguments you're making. One can imagine uh, an objection to, I, I think, perhaps uh, your argument or uh, even Scruton's argument here, right? Uh, where in the beginning you're talking about removing the idea of the nation or, or um, uh, trying to step back from from the sort of ethnic basis of the nation, uh, being perhaps based upon a skin tone or a pigment or something of this sort. And while we have our own issues here in America, you know, with race and everything else, and, and there's a number of questions, we at least, I think, in America are more open to the idea that, you know, America, even though it has, in a very Burkean sense, you know, history and traditions in which it's inherited from others, um, wasn't so much based in a... a a national identity insofar as an ethnic group, but it has, you know, an amalgamation. Whereas perhaps in, in European states and, and really everywhere else in the world outside of the, the U.S., uh, these things I think are closely tied to, you know, an ethnic uh, people. Um, and naturally we moved away from that, you know, over the last few centuries and, and there are, you know, certain developments there that, that are to be um, considered too. But, but one can imagine, getting to my question, one can imagine someone raising the objection saying, well, all well and good, you know, right? Great with your Burkean points and, and great that we have these traditions that are, are um, changing and, and flexible and, and uh, hold on to certain truths, but also can incorporate new ones or new discoveries or uh, new forms of life and living. But at the end of the day, you know, your English culture is still the English culture and the English ethnic one. And it's based upon years and centuries of, of white paste Englishmen going about their business and trying to figure it out. And, and where's my place in that? You know, uh, this, of course, is the common mantra we get from uh, the university today is, you know, we have all these white patriarchal figures. Where, where's the diversity? Where's, where's the other skin tones included in that? And how can we actually separate your tradition from the fact that, you know, it is based upon an ethnic identity? Yes, so uh, the fundamental question is, is the, um, uh, is the ethnic uh, dimension to nationhood, is it essential to nationhood or is it uh, a, a, a historical accident, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think the English should be outraged if the... Um, Italians start going around calling Christina Rossetti their national poet, for example, right? on the grounds that, uh, you know, <laughs> on the grounds that uh, her, her, her surname was uh, Italian, when um, uh, she, she was a, a, a devout um, uh, English Anglican uh, who, who, um, who broke off her engagement because her fiance became a ghastly um papist of a foreign <laughs> of a foreign religion um you know this um uh, uh, when you raise cases like that um mm. it's it becomes very difficult uh to show how consistently you can say well nation has absolutely tied up with um with the, the 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 blood in one's veins and my concern is that that actually this is extremely regressive regarding how to intellectually understand things the, you know 
part of the great intellectual revolution of Plato and Aristotle, uh, the, the Socratic uh, revolution, uh, why we call it a fundamental break with the pre-Socratics is precisely because they broke out of the purely materialist categories with which the pre-Socratics could only understand things. And, um, you know, whenever they asked themselves the question, what is being, the best they could come up with is being is fire or being is water or being is, you know, it, it, the, the introduction by, uh, by Socrates of uh, immaterial categories, um, the whole of Western intellectual history uh, is just downstream from that uh, revolution of the introduction of immaterial categories. And so the fact that we can't even think of how we morally stand toward the 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 land which we have made our own and which has has made us its own, without um, without uh, degenerating into purely materialist categories again seems to me um, uh, to 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 go back uh, uh, to to undo uh, two thousand three hundred years of intellectual progress. Right. That's a great point. Well, here, I'll, I'll pick up one more question for you, Sebastian, before I go to a question for, for Zoltan from Ferenc. Uh, Ferenc says, crucial point, second person discourse of nations. We could go further, or could we go further and argue for a dignity of nations? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, could you repeat? Well, that was a question to, to Sebastian. Yeah, to to Sebastian. Like, sorry. Yeah, then we'll get to you. Sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, I, uh, well, I, I don't. Uh, I don't. It, it depends what is meant by the term dignity here. But what I would say is that um, one of the values presupposed in most of what I've been saying uh, is that um, your attitude toward first the settled territory and then. The, the culture and the constitution, the people, um, uh, the civil society that is uh, in, inhabited, um, is that there is something lovable there. There is something to, to be treasured and, and held on to. Uh, and this is one of the terrible, terrible things that has happened in... in, in uh, our modern contemporary world is that there is a huge amount of national shame about um uh, you know uh, the english have a history of constantly poking fun at the french and the irish and so on um whereas actually if you go to ireland or or you go to romania as as, as i uh, um am compelled to do by my wife um the uh, they poke fun at themselves all day um, because, uh, uh, and, and not not in a English self-deprecating way, um, by poking fun at yourself in order to signal that you really think you're the best. Um, they they do it because they really do think they're the worst people on earth, <laughs> and and this is an this is a terrible thing. Um, this is a terrible thing, particularly since the Romanians inhabit one of the most beautiful parts of, of, of Europe um, and have an extraordinary culture. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, uh, incredible wine. If you haven't drunk Romanian wine, you're really, really missing out. Um, so th this is, um, uh, yes, I think you can speak about a, a dignity of nations. The problem is... Uh, the problem is not <laughs> the problem is not the dignity of nations. The problem is the shaming of nations at the moment. That's great, and we could go on there, I'm sure, and, and talk about a culture for repudiation. But to uh, to get Zoltan here in the mix, uh, Ferenc asks Zoltan, "How did Scruton talk about monarchy in the present context?" Okay, uh, now uh, in uh, Scruton, one work and uh, title is. Uh, England and elegy. Uh, he he uh, spoke of monarchy uh, um, in a quite nostalgic way, 
I think. So the English monarchy, the British monarchy, okay, it's, it's the correct, not English, to say British monarchy, is a, a constitution, it was always a constitutional monarchy, that uh, the king in a parliament, they say. And uh, now the role of the king or queen is uh, just a symbolic uh, role and clearly and just symbolic. No uh, power uh, connected with monarchy. And I think it's a, uh, in Scruton's view, it's not a progress. So uh, I think Scruton's uh, uh, think, think uh, about monarchy are quite like work. So he, he, he thinks that um, this mixed constitution uh, was a good thing and it could be maybe uh, 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 could be uh, uh, a, ki a kind of return uh, uh, to this mixed uh, constitution is uh, and that will uh, that would be a good thing but it's uh, it's not not uh, to be happen uh, uh, he, he thinks mm -hmm. so he is pessimistic about ah, it. yeah so he he accepts democracy but with reservations mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Well, I'll ask one more question, I think, and then we can open up perhaps into more general uh, question time for, for the whole uh, speaker uh, group today, including those who, who presented earlier. Um, but, but thinking about, you know, different movements within, within these discussions uh, and look, I think, at, at nationhood, you know, at the, the sort of arguments that, that Roger would make, one of the big uh, rising influences, I think, here in the States is uh, Yoram Hazoni. In his book, the virtue, the virtues of nationalism, uh, and I, I don't know how widely translated it is, so I apologize if, if some people here haven't seen it or you know have limited access or viewing to it because of uh, its its language. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a big push, and and Yoram has been hosting or Hazoni has been hosting a number of these national cons, uh, conservatism conferences, national conservative conferences, whatever they've been called, excuse me, um, uh, in the name of, of the sort of Birkin argument. And, and when you look at the argument itself, right, he, he gives a lot of similar um, justifications and, and reasons to support the idea of the nation, uh, as Roger does, and, you know, the, the traditions of a place, its history, its culture, its law, so on and so forth. Um, so I, I think on the whole, it's fairly in line with what Roger would have argued. Uh, but naturally, I think Roger also uh, steered it clear of, of the term nationalism. And, and this is, of course, Hozoni's big push is saying we need to frame this in, in terms of, of nationalism. Now, what we're saying is we're not globalists, uh, we're, we're nationalists, and we want to defend the idea of the nation state. And so my question is to the two of you, and perhaps others too, if, if anyone else wants to weigh in, uh, do we gain anything or lose anything by, by moving towards this new new framework uh, in, in, insofar as we should accept it or not, but, or whether or not we should even accept it, but is there anything to gain by, by going from patriotism to nationalism? I mean, arguing for, you know, your nation, uh, whichever one it might be. Uh, could, well, I'll give that a go. Um, uh, I, did, I, I did write a small study on this. Um, the regarding Roger's view of nationalism versus patriotism. Um, and he, you're right, uh, Ro Roger had a very rum view of, of the term nationalism and, it, and its uh, manifestations. Um, and, and I think it's for the reasons that I gave, that nationalism is a reduction of national loyalty to materialist categories. To, to, to an ethnic category, whereas patriotism denotes a moral disposition. And this is, and he wanted to reroute the argument in patri patriotic feeling of national identity, of, of, of the, the gratitude you have to the land which has received you, whether by, uh, by birth or invitation, uh, and the, um, 
the, the, the gratitude that you have toward that land and your desire to make a contribution to it, to, to its history. This is a moral uh, attitude uh, and completely consistent with conservatism as attitudinal rather than ideological um, over uh, the, the, the materialistic notion of um, I, this is my nation um, because, uh, because, because of reasons of blood and soil. You know, that, that this is, these, that is, uh, and, and I'm sorry, R Roger was pretty historically literate. He knew we've done all of that, okay? The 20th century was the saddest century uh, ever because we, we've gone through all of that. Um, so the whole argument had to be rerouted and, he, and, and, and I think that was one of his great achievements. Okay, any other any other thoughts from from Zoltana or anyone else for that matter? Any of our other speakers? Raymond, Raymond I think, has something to say. Uh, oh, yes. uh, sorry, I can't work the chat box. So I apologise for being an animal party yet again. Um, I, I did. I thought it was a beautiful talk, Sebastian. But um, I guess your final comment, which was about conservatism, is love. One would expect then moving to the right will be more love, but that's actually not what empirically one sees, particularly in the present. Uh, history, how Europe is at the moment. Okay. So that's the first point, and I wonder whether you could address that. But the other is, if you look at the time that Burke was writing, mm -hmm. one thing's not changed very much. The vast majority of people in the United Kingdom were living in absolutely grotesque poverty with scarcely any kind of support, justice, or anything. So if, if we've been Burkeans, remain Burkeans from 1791 or 1790, It'd be a pretty grim outlook for most people. So I know that's terribly simplifying, but I wonder whether you'd want to respond to those two points. Uh, it, it, uh, both to me? Uh, yeah, they were both to your good self, yes, because they came out of your, I mean, although, yes, thank you. Yes, um, okay, so uh, Another facet of Roger's thought, which I didn't talk about, but which, uh, in fact, I think it deserves a whole conference, is um, the is fake love. Let's put it that way, uh, uh, f fake love, which which he often used the phrase uh, sentimentalism for this. Yeah, and and I uh, I actually I actually think that. Um, if you come across a good old-fashioned uh, liberal, a good, a good English or uh, you know uh, socialist like Orwell or something, right? What what you find is yeah, you'll find differences between the, the worldview of that person and the, and the conservative, but but actually what you find is a, is a is a genuine love for civil society. Okay, you find genuine love for civil society. That is what you ought to find. Uh, among the, um, the, the uh, among conservatives, when you get to the caricature of conservatism in the kind of materialistic, nationalistic right-wing uh, movement that I've been uh, criticising, then what you don't find is an actual. You don't find a love for the nation. You find self-directed emotion. Right, yeah. which, which is sentimentalism, uh, which is, by the way, exactly the same fake emotion that you find uh, on on the person who goes out onto the street and sets fire to to police cars uh, it, it, with, with the with the belief that they are um, doing something good and noble. Well, the whole act is actually a, a celebration of self. And the, and so I, I think you just find less love the more caricatured true emotion uh, 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 becomes um, uh, into, into emotional fakery. Uh, regarding, um, regarding Burke, I don't know if I have misunderstood the objection, but Burke was not he never argued for um, for maintaining Europe in an 18th century social state. Uh, in fact, the, there are at least two uh, sentences in the um, uh, in the reflections 
in which he explicitly states, I am advocating change, he right. says. Right. Well, but what kind of change? Well, it's not revolutionary change, it's organic change. It's not change imposed by, um, uh, uh, by self-elected elites or anything like that. It's, um, it's change that comes through. And, and one of the things that good old-fashioned English socialists used to think, used to understand, is precisely that that good uh, organic change did come up through civil society. Um, you don't, you won't find many who think that today, but but that is what they used to think. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think Burke was. Um, I think that's a caricature of him. Thank you. Yeah. Well, was someone else going to say something? Yes, uh, I, I would like to address the question actually that you uh, raised, uh, Fisher. Can you hear me in this way if I talk it with uh, with? Uh, yeah, with the mic? It's coming through nicely. Okay, I I have a pro and a contra for for your question. The, the, the pro comes uh, from John Lukács, uh, the Hungarian-born American uh, historian uh, uh, of Jewish origin and Catholic uh, uh, religion. He argued in a late work of his that indeed nationalism is a dangerous path uh, for conservatives uh, and uh, generally for nations actually. Why? Because of the European uh, historical uh, uh, experiences of the 20th century that was mentioned earlier. So uh, actually, uh, he said that, well, if we are conservatives and we want to rely on our own experiences, we have to learn from it. An education of the soul or the self uh, leads us to be careful about it. But that's basically about national socialism, I would say, and, and of course the, 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 the experience uh, of uh, catastrophe and the Holocaust that I mentioned in my talk as well. So that's the pro for, for uh, Fisher's uh, uh, question or, or, or suggestion. And there is a contra, uh, which is that uh, Yoram Hazani in, in his book, um, which I um, reviewed uh, in Hungarian, uh, argues, uh, well, the first prerequisite for him is that, well, he is not talking about an ethnic uh, nationality. So when he talks about uh, the, uh, the, the, the national conservative agenda, it's not an ethnic one. So in this regard, there is no, no real difference, I think, between um, nationality-based uh, nationalism and, uh, and, and uh, the patriotic case. Uh, as neither of them would uh, rely on the ethnic uh, uh, background. But what is the, the point? What is the strength, I think, of the argument? The argument is that if we take out, uh, if we uh, step out from the uh, uh, English-speaking conservative uh, framework, where actually both in, in Britain and uh, in the in the US, we have got uh, actually empires and not uh, nations. Uh, then uh, in a European uh, conservative uh, context or uh, in, in the Western tradition, there is this other resource, the nation as uh, uh, the, the, uh, the basis of sovereignty. And he relies here on the, the biblical uh, 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 teaching uh, of uh, the Jewish nation. And, um, and his own country's experience. But he could uh, refer to other Western European countries or, or European countries as such. Uh, and the argument is this. There is no other uh, uh, unit, uh, political unit, uh, uh, political community, which could actually establish uh, a constitutional democracy, but a nation state. So why should we get rid of them? That's that's the argument. That's great. Well, thanks for for weighing in on that, Faring. Um, I'm just thinking how we want to continue here. Uh, are we just moving to a more general discussion now? Uh, should should we go ahead with that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, one question I did want to ask, and and you know, this is always brought up. This is one of one of the things that people notice. Something that we touched upon, I think, generally in this this last session with uh, with Zoltan and Sebastian, uh, is this. Similarity between you know Edmund Burke and Roger Scruton, uh, where you know here are two figures that were 
Um, it both started out really writing about aesthetics, thinking about beauty and art and these sorts of things, and made their transition over to politics and, and more specifically a, a conservative one. Um, and, and, and trying to, I think, conserve something that they saw important about their cultures. So I wondered if, if we might get some, some thoughts as to, you know, what exact, or, uh, what the significances of these similarities and why we often see this, this sort of connection between the aesthetics and the conservative, um, uh, the interest in aesthetics and, and the conservative disposition. And that's open to anyone that wants to, uh, to jump in. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not directing that at anyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, it's just a very good question, <laughs> but uh, maybe it's not not a not a, ra a rational connection. These two, so uh, it's maybe uh, it's a feeling that uh, someone um, worth preserving is also beautiful, and the uh, interest. To, to be interested in beautiful is uh, to be, uh, you say, the love, love of things. And uh, maybe it's a quite a, a platonic uh, uh, notion that, uh, that the beautiful is good also. And maybe that, that's why uh, conservatism and the aesthetics is connected in some way, and, uh, as Scruton and, and the Burke also. Can I provoke Zoltan on that issue? Uh, I think that uh, uh, it was Sebastian who mentioned false uh, or fake love. What if there is a fake beauty as well, or false beauty? I, the sort of beauty which cheats you and which is uh, which looks nice and you know uh, enchanting and then uh, when you open it up or when you look behind it's ugly and and immoral even we know about uh, this sort of uh, phenomenon uh, uh, both uh, from personal experience and uh, and uh, from uh, art history what is more you can even argue that beauty as such is something like that. It cheats you. Mm -hmm. it, it presents a world that looks nice and utopian and perfect. And that's not the case. We all know, and he knows it, uh, Scruton. He, he wrote the, that book on pessimism. So how comes beauty? Beauty cheats you and, 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 and uh, it's a false, uh, a fake thing. It's immoral. What's your answer to that? <laughs> well, can I can I speak to that for a for a sure. brief moment? Um, the, I think the, there is a connection between the conservative attitude and a sensitivity, an aesthetic sensitivity, and the connection is second personal perspective. You know, the, the, for example, in the, in the mid 20th century, the Marxists were very, very interested in art, but their reflections on art are in terms of its use. You, what, what are its propagandistic purposes? The, the, whereas conservative philosophers from Burke through Hegel and Roger and they have, a, have a desire to write about art as if it is valuable as an end rather than a means to something. Now, when you approach a painting, for example, you cannot simply think about your own view of it, or you're, you're sharing in a community of criticism of the painting, and you're in, in some way empt emptying yourself of your vision of the world, so as to adopt the vision of the world uh, possessed by the artist so that he could apprehend what he's embodied, incarnated in this canvas or whatever. So art becomes profoundly second personal when you, uh, when you cease to see it as a, as an, as a use or a means uh, and, and start to see it uh, as an end which I would just as a final point say, this is why the great uh, and, and uh, terrible ideologies of the 20th century 
did fall in at the level of art, music, architecture, and all of these things, fall into exactly this, the kind of fake beauty or kitsch that, that you are, um, that you're raising as, as problematic. That's great, Sebastian. And I wanted to uh, to bring Alicia in on this too. And uh, I don't know if you're prepared to speak to this, Alicia, uh, but going further with this idea of uh, sentimentality and kitsch and, and really bad art and, and what that might look like, I wondered if you or, or someone else on this call really might make the distinction uh, or help clarify the distinction that Roger makes in, in his work between imagination and, and fantasy. Uh, I think that might be a, a helpful one uh, for us to, to consider in the midst of this. Thank you. I'm I'm happy uh, to to step in um, and to say something on that. Um, but I think what is always important uh, to me when we talk about Roger's conservatism about how his philosophy or or philosophy is is translated into everyday life or into everyday politics. I'm always worried that we will end up making caricatures. We always have to make a distinction, or at least I think it's important to make a distinction. Are we dealing with philosophy or are we dealing with politics? Um, because um, it's true that for Roger, uh, for the way he looked to art, uh, for example, that um, uh, he saw it as, as, uh, as an ant and not just as, uh, um, uh, as a tool or only as, as, as something um, superficial. Um, and then you can, you, you, Sebastian, refer to the Marxist, uh, or did you say Marxist or the communist? They, they, they looked like that. And, and this doesn't give the whole picture. We cannot understand uh, the like the, the world through a couple of philosophers um, and this complex question. Um, I think Roger was very disappointed in many uh, uh, politicians today, in the conservative party today. I don't think they understood uh, art or judgment or anything um, as in, in such a profound way as Roger did. Um, so you can, of course, point to the left um, or to the middle or where do you want and, and, and say they did not understand. But actually, who does understand on the political, in the political arena uh, the, the profound ideas of Roger? And to be honest, I think not many people uh, uh, do. So I, I think it's just important to distinguish conservative philosophy with conservative politics. And, and it's not only to... To, I, I think it's also to protect Roger, because a lot of conservative politicians, they claim to be huge admirers of Roger, but actually they philosophy because they are so superficial. The things they say are, are in, in, in conflict with Roger's philosophy. And I think Roger often was, actually he was in a way said that people don't read him. And he was not said that the conservatives do not read him, but even people on the left stop reading him because we politicize everything. So if we think somebody wrong side of his, so for the left it was Roger, they didn't read him. Well, uh, it's a mistake that they have done. You should read people who do the effort to think for themselves. And those, um, like, uh, it's still an, it's still not the majority that uh, thinks for um, himself or herself, and Roger was one one person that did that. And so I did not really answer your question, maybe Fisher, but I think that's a very important thing. If we want to protect Roger's legacy for the future, um, and if we want him, and we wish him a, a huge audience, and if we want uh, that his philosophy will be read not only by our contemporaries today, but also for the future to come. I really think it's important to always stress that he was a conservative philosopher. And gosh, I really hope the conservative parties will really read him. And and if the world, if all the people who would call 
themselves conservatives would at least be like half as as uh, as Roger was, then we would already live in a better world. Yeah, that's a great point, Elise, and 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 much appreciated. And of course, you know this to give a, a personal plug here uh, is is one of the great goals of, of the foundation is really you know asking the question how do we insert you know a, a Scrutonian strain of thought into um, public discourse today and how do we bring Roger's thought to bear on, on these great questions of, of importance um, you know insofar as architecture is concerned or different other forms of culture but also politics more generally um, so so I'm, I'm right there with you and, and, and appreciate the uh, the correction um, I'm going to push you back to the original question I asked you though Alicia and say uh, might you say a word on uh, imagination we'll versus something French wants to add something. No, no, no. I, I think I, I hear first uh, Alicia, and I would return to the question of uh, Sebastian about this second person issue. But first, Alicia. No, no, I, 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 I talked already enough. So. <laughs> okay, uh, then, then we can return to that as well. But I, I, I would like to join the, the, the problem that Sebastian uh, uh, addressed. I, he, uh, he answered my question about the fake. Uh, Ness or uh, falsity of, of beauty. And he said that the second person perspective uh, is uh, gained by, by an appreciation of beauty, and that way we, we can connect it to, to morality and, and uh, the education of the soul. But can, uh, my question is this I, I think it's almost doing the, the job, but still uh, to try to you know, push it forward. What if we say that, well, the second, perspe second person perspective uh, should be uh, uh, there, even if uh, the artist is not presenting a beautiful world, but an ugly one, or at least one in which beauty and uh, ugliness uh, are both there. So why should uh, the artist be a, a classic, classicist, uh, a kind of, you know, perfectionist uh, a, 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 uh, uh, a new Mozart. 20th century art claims that, well, the world is not as uh, uh, harmonical and, and perfect as Mozart's music uh, would uh, suggest. So, in fact, to understand the other is to understand uh, his or her uh, angst, uh, his or her problems in the world, uh, and the artist can, uh, uh, you know, address our uh, attention and call uh, uh, us to sympathize with his or her feelings if the case is not uh, uh, for beauty but a case for you know this uh, perplexity of the human condition including the tragic uh, and 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 um, um, the, the the decay of uh, of uh, culture so i think uh, an honest uh, artist uh, one can argue, should um, provoke our interest and therefore help us educate our souls by invoking it uh, uh, through, uh, you know, calling our attention to the tragic, to the ugly, to the inhuman. Well, uh, uh, can I speak to that for a moment? Uh, very, uh, I'll try to be brief, but the, the, the I think the Western tradition of art uh, is exactly the place where you find a response to this. Uh, if you if you want to go down the 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 route of the transcendental attributes and how beauty is convertible with goodness and truth and this sort of thing, then then you it, it becomes very difficult to respond to your question. But if you want to go down the route of uh, the, the subject's response to uh, a, an artistic achievement, which is where, where I brought in the issue of genuine emotion and fake emotion, wh whether what, what it invokes in you is second personal perspective or self-directed emotion, where actually you're, you're sudden, suddenly gushing over your own response to the thing. The, the, this is uh, the sign of of, um, uh, of, of of a genuine artistic achievement that it invokes in you the former, and this is exactly what crucifixion scenes do. For example, 
cru crucifixion scenes are not images of the, uh, the of the perfect and the beautiful and the serene and so forth. It is uh, it is a, an image of a man being tortured to death, right? And it and 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 uh, crucifixion scenes invoke second personal perspective, uh, and so do, do, does the whole um, artistic tradition uh, set centered on the passion and the crucifixion. This is why when Roger did his famous documentary with with the BBC. He ended with a meditation on Pergolesi's uh, starboard martyr, and he and he comments: um, uh, the whole of human suffering is uh, encapsulated in this one piece of music. Well, that's an expression of second personal perspective, um, and that is why it is a huge artistic achievement. Well, and just to uh, add on a, a fun little point there, Sebastian, there, of course, is that great scene in, in the uh, BBC uh, documentary when he's talking to, I, I, the name escapes me of, of the, the artist, but a modern artist saying something about, you know, well, well, the point of art is to make that which is not beautiful, beautiful, you know, to take trash and put it on a pedestal for us to contemplate. And uh, Roger's uh, characteristic short retort is, yes, like a can of shit. And, uh, you know. <laughs> This just catches the man off course or off guard because, well, when you put it in those terms, okay, this is a little bit silly. Yeah. I think the Ray is, yes, want to join. Yeah. Sorry. Can I? Yes. Oh, thank you. I mean, uh, very interesting to talk about the second person perspective um, because, in many ways, when it, it's art that appeals to us collectively, like architecture, which clearly one of Roger's major preoccupations. One wonders whether actually it can be gathered up into the I-thou relationship. And I remember having a conversation with Roger. We both had a lot to drink, so this is probably not reliable as a report. <laughs> but uh, he agreed that in a sense, as well as a second person perspective, the first person plural was very important, we. And then I said to him, well, the talk of we, I just read uh, Slavanka Draculic's wonderful essays. You know, she just escaped from communism. She's a Croatian writer, a wonderful writer. And she said, at last I was free no longer to say we, but to say I. And it, 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 I think Roger's relationship to we, the collective we, the we of the community, was quite ambivalent. And I suppose I wonder if that's why he focused very much in his later years on Steve Darwell and other people, Buber and so on, on the second person perspective. But actually there's a lot of we, of the we perspective implicit in his thinking. But I'm speaking now as a non-scholar, I'd be interested in what the scholars think. Good. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I could have a go. I do. I just, I'm aware I've been chatting away a lot, so I was wondering if someone else. Well, so, I, I could, I could join uh, here uh, by way of saying that we are returning here. You know, when we talk about the we, we are talking about the public. Yeah. So, uh, the dimension of the public or civil society, for that matter, Sebastian used yeah. the term, um, and. Uh, in the same time, we are talking about um, the political community as well, uh, in the sense of uh, the community as a person, as, as uh, was mentioned by Zoltan as well. So it's it's very interesting. Or, you know, talking. We are. My my, my talk was about uh, uh, the Aristotelian Platonic tradition. In the in that tradition, of course, there was no such thing as a state. So they could say, well. Political affairs are public affairs, and in that sense, that there was no danger of uh, of mixing up uh, politics and and culture, for example, issues of social uh, affairs, uh, but not uh, public, uh, not uh, political affairs. That was not a problem for them. For us, it is a problem, and I think that in that respect, the Scruton is a member of uh, the British tradition, where the state is always, you know, a danger. And, and uh, the, the Central European experience, which was mentioned by Ray, reaffirmed it, that the state is a very dangerous uh, agent 
So if uh, the we of uh, our talk refers to the state as a political agent, let's uh, keep it as far away as possible. That's, that's, that's his uh, um, uh, understanding, I guess, here when he uh, emphasizes, uh, um, he, he gives an emphasis to, to, the, uh, to the distance uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the we perspective. On the other hand, he was, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of his favorites was uh, Hegel. And what else does Hegel, if not, you know, building up step by step, as Aristotle, by the way, did. And there is a literature on the connections between Hegel and the Aristotelian tradition, uh, building up from the individual's, uh, in, you know, in, inclusion in the family, uh, in the society, and finally the state as the most perfect form of, uh, of human community. So there is this ambivalence in the, in the great tradition of uh, modernity, uh, which was not there, I would claim, uh, for, for the Greeks, uh, for the Greek uh, community. I have to dissent uh, in, 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 uh, all, in all of Roger's books on conservatism, he rails against the view that um, the state is dangerous, or the state should be uh, uh, should be seen as as an enemy, or kept at arm's length, or anything like that. Um, uh, he he affirms the absolute need for a political order. What he believes is, in the Hegelian way you just described, that the political order arises out of the constitution, the settled way of life of civil society, of the pre-political uh, uh, moral unity, which is the nation, this people, this people who live together. It, what, what, he, uh, what, what he had no appreciation for is something that would be better termed an anti-state, which is this great monster believing itself to be the author of civil society. Right, which which unfortunately has been the Eastern European uh, conception of the state in the twentieth century. Right, but it was a Russian, uh, you know, notion, not an Eastern European. Be careful. Or a communist. This is uh, so. So I just think the term state is just being used in two different ways uh, here. But I think that that's that's because of Roger, actually, because when he writes about the, the communist uh, state, he has this very negative uh, sense and uh, which was mentioned by Ray. And when he speaks about his own, uh, you know, tradition or his own uh, uh, ideal, uh, then uh, the state becomes that uh, that nice things which uh, builds up. But uh, as soon as he talks about uh, you know, the Conservative Party in present day Britain as uh, representing the state. You know, he is much more careful once again. So again, I think the dilemma is within the, 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 the over of, of, of Roger. And in that sense, I, I share Ray's uh, uh, point that, that this, uh, you know, this is a huge uh, uh, work uh, and a huge, uh, and, and uh, you know, sometimes the very um, uh, self-contradictory uh, uh, over and uh, in fact uh, our job is in this sense to try to work out what is uh, relevant uh, and uh, what is the solution for the contradictions or to point out the contradictions and learn from that you know it's not like a saint uh, that we are discussing uh, and a hagiography that we would like to read write but uh, try to, to to work with it Maybe uh, I, I just uh, have a comment on sure. this. So maybe I think uh, uh, Scruton uh, thinks that uh, there, there is a uh, <clears throat> bureaucratization uh, in mo modern times of the state. And, uh, and that's why, uh, so the, uh, the England analogy in this uh, work, he, he, he refers this. Uh, uh, bureaucratization of, of the the old uh, or um, not 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 the recent uh, uh, evaluation of the state 
and uh, maybe that's why because uh, that that that's uh, <clears throat> a bureaucratization causes this ambivalence uh, maybe mm. yes the way variant concept yes uh -huh. well I, I wanted to jump in here and just see if we had any more questions from our audience what? i know we can hang around um, i think albert wants to ask albert shutter wants to thanks, ask thanks alicia yeah, if, it, if it's okay, uh, I have a question for Ray, uh, and it, it moves on nicely from the uh, the, the, the idea of, uh, because I, I don't know Rogers, I don't know the work England Analogy, um, I'm looking forward to reading it, but um, yeah, Weber talked about the disenchantment of uh, society, and uh, <clears throat> and I know that yourself, Ray, and, and Roger talked about scientism, and the kind of overreach of, of uh, post-enlightenment rationalization. Um, uh, and it's quite a general question, really. I just wonder, uh, I wonder whether it's worth thinking about uh, whether different personalities on an individual level, whether some people might benefit from a more creative um, a more creative approach uh, by way of kind of appreciate, appreciating art and culture and other people. This is this kind of a, a personal discovery from uh, from studying philosophy. Myself, I, I'm very much very much somebody who's who exists in the world of feelings, and uh, and philosophy has really taught me uh, how to separate out the reason. And so I, th I think on a personal level, maybe. Uh, maybe some of us require a bit more feeling and some of us require a bit more uh, reason. And, and as, a, as a neuroscientist, I don't know whether you have any, uh, a neurosurgeon, sorry, I don't know whether you have any experience of if there's evidence for, uh, for, for that, being, that being a worthwhile angle. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a neurosurgeon except by accident in a car. Um, so basically, I, I am indeed into neuroscience. Um, I, I think neuroscience has little or nothing to say about this. I mean, speaking as a neuroscientist, I know how little neuroscience takes. I remember there's a famous argument of discussion between Chekhov and Tolstoy, and Tolstoy was going on and on about peasant virtues. And Ch Chekhov says, look, I was brought up amongst the buggers. I know how awful they are. And I feel as if, likewise, other people are dazzled by neuroscience. And I know actually how little we tells us about ourselves, particularly in these rather complex questions. I mean, it was, it's very interesting what you say, but it's difficult to imagine a legislation that, as it were, was so specific that it legislated for the balance in people to the extent to which they wish to be regulated or unregulated and so on. It's quite interesting, the whole disenchantment story has proved to be more complex. Clearly, there were two dimensions to the Weberian disenchantment. One is, um, as it were, the advance of science and uh, no longer looking to magical explanations of what happens or to religious or spiritual explanations. And the other, of course, was the advance of bureaucracy. Um, and again, I think Weber, there may be, I'm sure there are Weber experts certainly who know more than I do in, in, in amongst the rest of us. But it seems to me that Weber was very ambivalent about that. There was a kind of deep honesty and accountability in bureaucracy. At the same time, there was a stifling constraint. Um, but coming back to your particular question, it would be difficult to know how to modulate the extent to which a state is bureaucratic and indeed the scope of a state to, um, as it were, to be tweaked for the different um, requirements, spiritual outlooks, and so on uh, for for the, the populace. So it's an interesting question, but it's not one I think would be easy to answer, and certainly beyond my pay grade to answer, yeah. <laughs> Hope, I'm just hoping there's somebody out there who can give you your money's worth and answer the question. <laughs> sort of, uh, <laughs> you can ask for your I money back. Slightly, uh, <laughs> I feel slightly uncomfortable with the the notion of separating out separating out reason from emotion. Mm. Um, uh, the the two certainly must be distinguished. But one of the 
uh, one of the things that uh, one of the great achievements I would say of Roger's uh, writings was was actually the integration of reason and emotion. Um, after you think uh, there's a line I don't know where um, in uh, one of Saint Paul's epistles in which he says you, you must uh, crucify the body with all of its emotions. Um, and you might think this sounds uh, rather grim, but, but he, he immediately begins talking about the resurrection. Uh, for, of course, what St. Paul has in mind is that um, if, you, if you can uh, integrate the life of the emotions and the passions, then you get them back again glorified. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the Baroque cathedral uh, is not a is not a work of pure emotion, uh, not a work of pure reason. The Baroque cathedral is the fruit of of uh, um, a grace filled integration of reason and emotion. Um, and so I I, I would uh, anyway. That's just a little thought on that. Very interesting. Yeah. Maybe I can clarify the question for either of you then. If you can still hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the question is, is more to do with salvation in art, actually, which is my bad for, for, for not, not phrasing it quite succinctly enough. But for, for Ray specifically, you know, the idea of salvation in art, I mean, salvation can be seen as quite a personal thing. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, the dis disenchantment is a little bit misleading because it comes from um, Schiller. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, and I don't really know how it links, how Weber links between Schiller and Scruton. Uh, but but nevertheless, the, the idea of salvation in art for for some people, I mean, Ray, do you think, for instance, that it's that it's a a viable uh, a viable position to take to say that for some people, uh, salvation can come through an intellectual um a more reasoned practice and for others it can come through a more emotional practice and and maybe yeah yeah that's it i mean that that seems prima facie quite pl uh, quite quite uh, you know plausible um whether is there any salvation to be available ultimately for those of us who are secular uh, of a secular disposition obviously there is nothing in any way will cancel death and all the losses on the way to death. So in that sense, salvation is not available. Um, but the, clearly there are intermediate forms of salvation, of transformation of one's life and of the sense of a life worth living and worth to have lived. Um, whether you could partition that between those who get joy through intellectual activity and then those who get joy through emotional engagement, I think that would be unlikely. I suspect obviously some people are extreme in one respect or the other, but generally most of us are a mixture and I'm very much with Sebastian, you know, reason is and should be the slave of the emotions. Um, and, and they are inseparable. You know, as there's a lovely line from Lichtenberg, he said, I got angry on my own advice. And there's tremendous interaction between the reasons one has and the emotions one feels. Yeah.